So please welcome Mr. Micha, our uh, our speaker, uh, one of our speakers for the first tech workshop in Africa and Middle East region. He is working as a senior security consultant and Dream Lab technology in Sweden, and he will talk about the STEM project and utilization of text emulation. So, Mike, with you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, I would like to talk about two things. First of all, the, the SUPAN project, which is this uh, project about sharing an automation of privacy preserving attack neutralization, which is quite a, a mouthful. I get into a little more details on what this actually means. And then the utilization of MITRE and the MITRE attack emulation plans within uh, this project. Now, a lot of this has already been said. My name is Misha. I'm 34. 34 years old. I have been working in IT security for about the last 10 years. So not since I've been 10 years old, but for the last 10 years in various roles from analyst to project manager and penetration tester. Um, currently I'm a pen tester and project manager for Dream Lab Technologies in Switzerland. And I'm involved in the SAPAN project as a coordinator for Dream Lab. If you would like to get in touch with me, uh, please use this email here below. The outline for my talk today, I would like to give a quick high-level overview on SAPAN, what it actually is about, and then get into a little more details on what we used MITRE and the attack emulation plans in the context of SAPAN. So, I already mentioned this subbunch stands for sharing and automation for privacy preserving attack neutralization. Um, it is a EU funded project in the Horizon 2020 program, and it is about dynamic countering of cyber attacks. Um, and it's been running since May 2019 and will finish in April 2022. So it's a three year project. Um, boiled down to just a few bullets, you could say it is about three things. First of all, it is about meant to be a platform for sharing um, and automating response to recovery actions. And it wants to do that using advanced data analysis, analysis and machine learning techniques. Um, it, a second aim is to decrease the effort required by security anal analysts um, to find optimal responses and ways to uh, recover and respond to attacks. And it wants to do this not within a single organization, but across organizations through uh, privacy preserving methods um, for sharing. <clears throat> um, this is, is not done by in Dream Lab alone. This is a, a whole consortium mixed um, from academia and industrial partners. Um, we have the Fraunhofer Institute for Technology, the University in Aachen and Stuttgart as well as some industrial partners from HP, um, Cessnet, F-Secure, and DreamLab. And the University of Brno in Czech Republic. There we go. So this is the promised high-level overview on SAPAN. What is it about? Um, I think the easiest way to explain this is by looking at how we currently use intrusion detection systems. So imagine a sample scenario where you have your networks monitored um, within individual organizations. Um, you are monitoring for suspicious patterns and these suspicious patterns, they trigger alerts. And these alerts, they can be resolved by response and recovery actions that you have to find in, in playbooks um, for certain detections that you're making in your, in your network. And whenever there's a new threat emerging, um, new threats, they can always cause new patterns that you're looking for. And this is a, a repeating cycle. There are some common challenges in here uh, in this IDS approach. Um, first of all, there's the limited availability um, of processed data. Um, for instance, SMEs, small, medium enterprises, they usually have less IDS capabilities because they lack the tools and the data and the personnel to uh, to to get into this. It's it's difficult to identify attacks with new patterns. 
and you typically have many false positive alerts which uh, keep security analysts busy or even overwhelmed as they try to to make sense of all the, the alerts um, and then also data sharing amongst um, uh, organizations could lead to the privacy and confidentiality uh, violations um, all of this and of course so much more but all of this leads to long detection times in the real world. So we know that uh, about two thirds of uh, all cases that get detected take more than five hours. That was the case at least in 2017. Um, and for about 20% of all cases, the detection takes actually more than one month. And the idea basically of SAPAN is that if you find a way to share detection models, and actionable response and recovery information between different companies and doing so in a way that preserves the privacy of the individual participants in this uh, construct, um, then you, sh you should be able to decrease these uh, detection times drastically. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what we are trying to do in SAPAN. <clears throat> now, how do we want to do this? Um, I think that's best explained on this conceptual view. So we distinguish between local uh, actions on the left side and global actions on the right side. So the idea is that you have a single organizations, which we call a local um, entity, and then you have a global construct that's made out, made of all the, the connected organizations. And on the left side, you have this typical um, response and recovery process uh, where you collect First, cybersecurity data, logs, flows, forensics data, and what have you. Um, then you do some sort of detections on these events, uh, on these data. You get events out of there. You assess these events. And for some of them, uh, you might create incidents. And then once you have incidents, you handle these incidents and close them. And throughout of this uh, process here, you can have a sharing of information with other uh, participants or with the global instance of uh, a sub one where you, sh you can either share raw data for detection or you can share data detection mechanisms um, and in response from the from the platform or from the central entity you get back uh, information on how to detect threats and then the same uh, pattern uh, repeats itself again in uh, when you're dealing with incidents so you can share your assessment approach you will get back best practices, and in the end, you might share your handling model for a certain incident again. To make this a little less abstract, uh, we can also look <clears throat> at the architecture of the whole system. Again, you have on the lower part, you have the local level, so the level of the individual organization. And then in the upper part, you have the global level uh, or the level of the sharing system of, uh, or the sharing platform of SAPA. So you may have uh, several organizations, of course, in this whole, whole construct, but if you're looking just at two to explain how we think of it or how we want it to work, you have an organization A where you have a security operations center, for instance, and that has an agent. And in this security operations center, you will install a component from SAPAN that's called the intelligence provider. And the idea of this intelligence provider is that it analyzes and sanitizes data and then sends it to the sharing system. So the job of this part here is to collect and share data and doing so in a, in a privacy preserving way. Um, this data can then be queried or shared with another organization B. Um, this has two more con uh, components. One is a filter manager where you're filtering what you're actually getting. Uh, and the other one is the intelligence consumer. And the job of this intelligence consumer is to retrieve uh, intelligence from the sharing system and then uh, make it available to, to local detection and response systems in the organization B. So that could again be a CM system that can be other tools that the organization B has in their uh, security operations center. And the idea here is that you use the, the detection system and your response capabilities based on the intelligence you get from uh, from the SAPAN platform. And the whole thing actually reminds you very strongly of MISP, at least from the architecture. And that's what we are actually, what we are actually going to use uh, under the hood. So this whole thing will be based on MISP, um, but the magic of course happens in these 
intelligence provider and consumer uh, components as well as on the global sharing platform. Where are we now? Um, we are in month 27, so July 22, uh, July 21 is month 27 of 36 months, so of the overall three years. Um, we have a, a framework for machine readable playbooks uh, where you can describe uh, response to recovery information. We are about to um, sync this up with uh, already existing standards like uh, Cacao that's currently being developed. Um, we have done and are still doing lots of research on local detection methods. Um, we have a few use cases. Uh, one of them revolves around detection of algorithmically generated domains. So this is the first point here, this DGA detection. Second one is classification of phishing URLs. If you're receiving emails that contain uh, suspiciously looking URLs, um, then there's a thing about host and application profiling based on network and endpoint data. So this is more about anomaly detection based on this kind of data, wherever you, you just look at your whole network and your whole organization and you're trying to find anomalies and deviations from the norm. Most of this uh, is done by using um, deep neural nets um, that is trained, of course, on, on training data. And for all of this, you also need test data. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, then we've also done research on the automation of playbooks, and we're going to do more research on that. Um, the idea would be to automate as much as you can from, uh, from carrying out of uh, these response and remediation actions that you've defined in the playbook. So this, uh, this is the idea of uh, security orchestration and automation in here. Um, there's research on this anonymization of uh, information. There are ways that you can, for instance, share um, training data or uh, test data for these models in a privacy preserving way without sacrificing too much of, uh, of model accuracy. And we're also doing research on federated machine learning. So that's sort of a twin idea to that, where if you're going back to this view, um, in federated machine learning, you would not share complete models between uh, these two. Uh, levels, but you would only share model updates and again, doing that in a privacy preserving way. So this would enable you to train a global model on this right hand side by just sharing single updates between the, the different levels. <clears throat> All right, so, so much for the project stop on what this is about and where we are right now. So what does ha this have to do with Mitra? Um, as I said, we need training and test data for doing what we are doing in uh, SAPAN, and that's where the MITRE attack emulation plans came in very handy. And I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes to tell you about what and how we did in this direction. So all the SAPAN stories that we have in mind, they usually start with some sort of a local detection mechanisms where you're detecting security incidents in a given organization. And as you've seen, a lot of the, the research we, we are doing is about actually finding um, new ways to detect uh, things on the local level. And this whole story about anomaly detection is a, is a very good in the general approach to, to detect malicious activities in, the, in an organization. So, and um, that's why we are we're doing some very specific things with the DGA and phishing detection, but also just looking at anomalies or looking for anomalies in the network. Um, so we are developing new, uh, new detectors that are, for instance, utilizing network data. So that can be NetFlow, connection logs, or even full packet captures, um, as well as endpoint data. Um, for instance, we're looking at uh, process launch events in the, in the Windows event log or in, in uh, syslog. Um, and for all of this, you need reliable and labeled test data. And this turned out to be a little tricky to come by. Uh, so we decided to, at least in some instances, make our own. And that's where, in parts, the, the MITRE frameworks uh, come in. So what did we base these test data on? Um, in some cases, it was just a simple exploitation of uh, some known vulnerabilities, for instance, Eternal Blue or this uh, Drupal 
uh, vulnerabilities that are um, already a little dated, but still um, as a proof of concept for these uh, detection methods have their viability. And we're also using another internal scenario based on this APT29 attack emulation plan, uh, which indeed came in very, very, very handy um, for creating test data. So what's this all about? Um, we used a, a cloud <clears throat> environment where we're simulating a very small enterprise uh, called, the, I think it was called the pharmology. Uh, so just a fig, um, uh, a fantasy enterprise. There's an attacker machine uh, separated by a firewall, and then some internal machines. I guess they, you would say they can they can be in a demilitarized zone, but it doesn't really matter because the the attack doesn't really start on this uh, first workstation machine here. So. We took the, the APT29 emulation plan and we adopted it a little bit for our needs in SAPAN. Um, first of all, we only utilized the first scenario. There are two scenarios described in this uh, emulation plan. We used the first one. Uh, we switched from Poppy Rat that is, was used in this first scenario in the plan to Posh. Uh, C2, which is very similar, just another command and control framework. I think it even is also mentioned in the, in the emulation plan. And we're also making use of some uh, living off the land binaries uh, to avoid detection. So we're using um, or abusing RunDLL32 and this runtime broker executable on the, on the attack systems. The actual scenario that we played out is this one. Um, I have ref the references to the single mitre techniques um, from the um, from the mitre tactics in the parentheses, and we are starting with an initial breach of this workstation one just by uh, a user executing malicious executable. Um, this is this uh, dropper of the posh framework which is configured to migrate into an instance of the runtime broker. So we're using process injection here. Um, and this dropper is actually executed through uh, assigned binary proxying um, using this run DLL32. So here we are simulating somewhat of a sophisticated phishing payload um, that the user would activate without knowing or without realizing what, what's actually happening. Um, then we're, this is, this was the main reason I think that we were using the, the Porsche instead of Poppy because Porsche has a, a way to rotate communications for its beaconing. So we can provide a list of predefined, predefined URLs and then Porsche will rotate through these um, URLs for its communication, making it much harder to, to detect. Um, once we have a, a working command and control connection with this workstation when we um, collect interesting files. So this is this smash and grab idea. You just break in and grab everything you can and then you run away. We exfiltrate this collected data through the same command and control channel. Um, then we enumerate additional machines by querying the active directory. So there is a, if you look at the topology again, there is a domain controller down here, which at the same time uh, also serves as a DNS server. Um, and by querying this uh, Active Directory here, we find the second workstation. And then we do a, a remote code execution on the second workstation through uh, PowerShell. Uh, and download and execute the push payload again on the second workstation. And then this whole process of communication rotation, collection of files, exfiltration, repeats itself until we, in the end, finally finish the, the whole experiment by killing all implants. and uh ending what we are doing so in summary these were the the mitre attack tactics that uh, have been used in um in this scenario um again the same information but visualized in the in the mitre matrix um which again is a, is a very nice way to to visualize things and keep um keep the overview of what you're actually doing and we have a couple of takeaways from this uh, this red team experiment that we've done based on this emulation plan. So 
um, we learned that we can actually really use this um, emulation plan at least as a, as a um, technically enough competent reader to simulate realistic attacks. Uh, so I'm saying this because for you it's probably obvious or self-evident, but for us it was the first time using this evaluation or emulation plan, and they turned out to be really easy to, to work with. Um, so they also helped their purpose uh, very much. Um, for two reasons, they uh, also they, they described uh, they describe very well what what happens in a given scenario, but they also leave enough room for uh, uh, customization, and because of that, they are very easily uh, and efficiently adoptable. The next step for this will be, um, if necessary, we are not quite sure yet, but we'll probably do more. Uh, further atom experiments, for instance, compromising the active directory that you've seen in the topology. Um, we're going to use the, the data that was gathered um, in this experiment um, for testing and training these, um, these local detectors I've mentioned before. So during the whole um, experiment that you've seen, we have been collecting data for once here on the, on the firewall. Um, and Second, also on the on the workstations, they had an agent running that collects host data, process launches, and so on. Um, and we also uh, keep experimenting with the automation of the re remediation of such attacks um, based on, on this data that we've collected. So yeah, that's how we what we are doing in Sapan so far, and what we are have used. Uh, this might be an emulation plan for. And I'm hoping that you find this all very, very interesting. And I'm aware that I only uh, share the glimpse of what we are actually doing. Um, if you're interested to see more or hear more about this, I have a recommendation or something I would like to ask you. If you would like to in get involved and learn more about this, there is a, an end user committee that we are currently looking for members. What does this mean? Uh, we'd like your help with um, participating in some interviews after some demonstrations we are going to do um, of the project results. Um, and we would, after this demonstration, we would ask you to, to fill out a survey, two surveys actually, uh, where you assess, assess the, the validity and how much you think you might benefit or you would benefit from the results developed in the project. This will all take not that much time. It's, it will probably be two surveys plus one demonstration, about two hours each, so about six hours in total. Um, you can expect some things in return. We can't pay you, but we can provide you with early access to results. So this is research. We can also provide you with early access to implementations uh, if they're open source, for instance, these uh, detectors I've been talking about. Um, and you can also get access to, to new detectors, even if they are closed source, which is not the case as far as I know. So if you're interested in this, please hit me up using this uh, email address below. Um, I think it is a nice uh, opportunity to learn more about the whole project and get your, maybe even get your hands dirty a little bit yourself. And with that being said, I think I'm, yes, I think I'm at the end of my talk. I thank you very much for your attention and your interest, and I hope to hear from at least a few of you on my email address. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and the conference, and speak to you soon.